As we all know, we've seen the failures of capitalism with growing inequality. We see deteriorating conditions for workers, yet the system seems to thrive. Why is that? And why is it that we have not seen the type of labor militancy that this country experienced in the lead up to the New Deal? Now, there is some good news. There is this willingness to focus on capitalism that hasn't really been the case for generations in this country. That's the good news. The question is though, how do we organize? How do we use that to our advantage to reform the system, to change this system? And here to talk to me about that is Vivek Chibber, who is a professor of sociology at New York University and has published widely on social theory and politics. He's also the editor of the journal Catalyst, which he launched in 2017 and the author of his latest book, The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. Vivek, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. Can you, yeah, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, you sound great. So All right. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about this, especially because it's so fitting given what you typically like to lecture and talk about, which is this um, focus on uh, identity, this focus on culture, which has really taken over our political discussions. It's really taken over academia for, for many, many years. And it's been a shift away from class consciousness. And just today, uh, Justice Stephen Breyer uh, you know, told White House officials that he plans on retiring soon. Uh, it's likely to happen in June. And immediately there, there have been some um, reports, some speculation in regard to who Biden is, is gonna replace him with. And the focus has been squarely on identity. Which is fine, but there's really no discussion about the substance of the individuals that we're discussing. It's just, he wants to replace Breyer with an African American woman. Okay, great, but we have a very pro corporate Supreme Court. What about the representation for workers? And that's not part of the discussion at all. So can you discuss why that is? This is something that's been ongoing in the country. The answer is simple, Anna. It's because there is no social group, social agency, and social force pushing our politics in a more substantive direction. It's kind of interesting that the discussion goes immediately to getting a, a black woman or a Latino uh, when Biden made a choice on those grounds for his vice president. And look how that worked out for him. The most unpopular vice president in modern history serving the most unpopular president in modern history. So you would imagine that they might learn their lessons from this, but there's no inclination to do so. And the reason for that is as long as they keep playing this game, this game of a thickening the multicultural identity of the political elite, of the corporate elite, they can pass it off, they can palm it off as somehow being progressive. And the reason is that in the circles that actually dominate politics today and political discussions today, those circles being the class of journalists, politicos, academics who are involved in it, they all come from a class background where these identity concerns is what really motivates them. And so the filter that sort of stands in the way of the public and the elites, that filter being the media, being the intellectual, being the journalist, that filter is perfectly happy to play this game because it allows the entire complex, the political elite, the corporate community and the intellectuals never to take up the kinds of issues and the kinds of policies that would benefit the vast majority because those policies go against the interests of the most powerful sections of society. And I mean, you certainly see this with both political parties, just this willingness to endlessly you know, fall into culture war issues. More recently, I would argue, manufactured culture war issues. And it's it's just dominating the news cycle, it's dominating political debate. And um, you know, it, it can be traced back to, you know, you write uh, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and how there was this shift away from class consciousness and just this hyper focus on cultural issues in lieu of class consciousness. Can you talk about that context a little? Yeah, the fall of the Soviet Union certainly played a role in this, but the fundamental issue was the decline of the labor movement. You know, if you look back at the history of liberalism, Anna, uh, liberal politics has 
it starts up around 1830, 1840, you could say, modern liberalism, perhaps a little bit earlier. From the start, liberalism was attached to the ambitions and the interests of small property classes, the salaried shopkeepers, um, professionals. And it was always aimed at getting a place for themselves within the ruling order, more say, more influence, etc. And easily veered into culture wars, cultural issues, and narrow politics. What made liberalism for a brief period attuned and sensitive to the concerns of working people was that those people organized themselves and forced their demands onto the agenda. And the high point here would be from the 1920s after the Russian Revolution and influenced by the Russian Revolution into the 1960s, LBJ being the last incarnation of this. That was the heyday of progressive liberalism. And the reason it was progressive was that you could say the left civilized them. The left showed them the importance of looking at and attending to the needs of the vast majority. Since the decline of the labor movement in the 1980s, what you've seen is a kind of a degeneration of dominant discourse and liberal culture as well. We are in the midst of that now. What we are seeing now is essentially what we call identity politics is a political battle within the top 20% of the population for a seat at the table and for the a pie, a slice of the pie that hasn't grown very much in the last 20 years because we've been in an era of very slow growth. In slow growth capitalism, you start fighting over who's gonna get a slice of a pie that's not expanding very much. And in that, you see these culture wars being an instrument for that towards that end because the professional classes, the politicians, etc., use their identities as a currency to try to embarrass or shame or to mobilize some constituency for whatever ends that they can manage. It's in my view, it's connected to the decline of the social forces that forced dominant and liberal culture to be serious about being wide ranging and serving the needs of the vast majority. I mean, I think it's it's clear we see how it all plays out and how it, it also, in my opinion, very intentionally divides people who could very easily find solidarity in just taking a good hard look at their working conditions, at their wages, at how things play out in their workplaces. But a lot of workers have been distracted from that and and the focus has been on you know, the identity differences among them, which makes it incredibly difficult to organize. You know, you, can you explain uh, the difference between class consciousness and, and how it differs from uh, false consciousness? Well, the expect class consciousness, very simply put, is a situation where workers understand two things. Their common interests across the class with each other regardless of ethnicity, regardless of race, and regardless of gender. And on the other hand, they're the interest being opposed to those of their employers, to the people who are who they're working for and who are making a profit off their labor. So class consciousness has both of these elements in it. Now, among radicals and leftists, for the longest time there's been this expectation that, hey, if we can see that workers are being treated badly and that they benefit from coming together, then they should too. And we don't see them coming together. So the question becomes, why don't they? Why aren't they banding together to fight better? And the answer from intellectuals has been, well, obviously they're not as smart as us. They don't understand their interests the way we understand their interests. And so their consciousness is a false consciousness. By false, it means they're systematically mistaken in their appreciation, in their understanding of their own surroundings, in their understandings of their own interests. That's supposed to be false consciousness. Now this reflects a kind of an arrogance on the part of intellectuals, and that's what I try to explain in my book. Intellectuals are very easy to slide to the position that the problem is with the workers and their culture and their ideology, etc., and their failure to understand what the intellectuals understand. The reality is the reason, as you said, workers get sucked into identity politics, workers get sucked into other sorts of things is because when they're disorganized, when they don't have organizations that back them up, when they don't have trade unions, they have to stick to whatever they find as a means of defending themselves against their employers. And typically what they find available to them is their ties of ethnicity, ties of kinship, their family structures. 
because people still tend to live in ethnically homogenous neighborhoods and racially homogenous neighborhoods. They tend to marry within their own race, they tend to marry within their own ethnicities. Those ties substitute for an enabling organization, an enabling institute set of institutions that a state could provide them. And so the identities attached to them, being an Italian, being a, 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 a Catholic, being a male instead of a female is something that they can get some material sustenance out of because when you when you need to find a job, who do you go to? Your cousin. When you need to, when it's a time of dearth and you're um, unemployed, you don't have uh, um, means of uh, uh, making ends meet. Who do you go to? Your family, your parents. All of that is ethnically and racially homogenous. So identity politics becomes a way of sustaining yourself because there's nothing else that you can rely on. The way out of it is through that collective organization. The problem with that is. How do you organize when you're working at Amazon, when you're working at Walmart and the entire entity is geared towards mm-hmm. blocking, getting in the way of any worker organization? So what happens? Either you get identity politics or people just tune out and most of the working class tunes out of politics. It feels that there's no point in it. I mean, that's certainly reflected in voter turnout. Even when we look at uh, elections where we have significant voter turnout, you look at the group of people who decided not to vote at all and it's still, much larger than those who decided to go to the polls. So that's that's certainly a, a, a continuing problem. But you know, there is a little bit of good news. So I want to get to that because all of a sudden you are seeing some labor militancy. You know, we recently talked about the Kroger workers in Denver who decided to strike and they just ended that strike because they got a contract they liked. Some of the employees are now getting up to $5 additional per hour. So it shows that organizing your workplace, having a union representation with a strike fund to kind of keep you whole during a strike is really, really important. I think that's inspiring other workers in, in various workplaces. Uh, but you did touch on the fact that you know there's a big problem at play when it comes to these major corporations like Amazon, for instance. We saw the failure of the Bessemer, Alabama unionization effort, uh, that Amazon warehouse. And so talk a little bit about the obstacles in place and what needs to be done to overcome them. You know, it's interesting, um, you're absolutely right that there is an uptick in strike activity. But it's an interesting point, uh, there almost all these strikes are undertaken by workers who are already organized, who are already in unions. They're not spontaneous job actions by unorganized workers. And that tells you something. Uh, first of all, that workers, hey, look, uh, labor markets tighten up and the, they're, they have these uh, support checks coming from the stimulus bill. And now suddenly they're less terrified. And when they're less terrified, you see them abandoning identity politics abandoning the kind of quiescence of the last 30 years. And they're suddenly seem to be raising their voice exactly as a kind of a, you know, an economic and a materialist approach to politics would predict. That's point number one. Point number two is it's only happening when they're already in unions. And why is that? It's because if you don't have that support behind you that a union gives, that assurance that when you walk out of the job, you will have a strike fund, you'll have some support, you'll have a media presence, there'll be a propaganda campaign. If you don't have that, it's you and your fellow workers against what? Starbucks, Amazon, Walmart. Walmart and Amazon have revenues the size of small countries. Mm -hmm. They own politicians, they own the judges, they own the media. You're up against everything. And so it's the, the, when the power balance is that bad, and on top of that, there's the fact that labor law in the United States is, it might as well not exist. Mm-hmm. It is so in geared towards employer interest. It's so hard for employees to strike. You know, It's legal in the United States to bring in replacement workers if your workers go out on strike. Yep. It's a, it's a miracle that you have any strikes at all when it's legal to do that. In most of the world, an express part of labor law is if, a union goes out on strike, you have to negotiate with them as an employer. You can't bring in replacement workers. The Taft-Hartley law allows you to do that. So the whole system is set up to reinforce the power of the employers, not to put a check on that power. That's why workers don't strike. It's not because they're stupid. 
It's not because they have false consciousness. It's not because they don't understand their situation. It's because they understand it all too well. And that's why the work of getting them organized takes extraordinary amounts of resources, skill and commitment, um, which thankfully has worked in the past and maybe it will do so again. Yes, um, and you know, you brought up Starbucks. Uh, the Starbucks workers in Buffalo, New York, uh, took a tremendous risk and uh, attempted to unionize, and they succeeded. So uh, it's still possible; it can be done. Uh, but I think it's really important to understand all of these various forces at play. I think you're right about that. Um, and as depressing as a lot of the news is, I, I do find a little inspiration in. In the very least, in the change that I'm noticing in, in the way people are thinking about politics and the way people are understanding things from a more materialist lens rather than um, just allowing, for lack of a better phrase, the professional managerial class to make the decisions for them and, and tell them what's really wrong. You know, People are starting to realize, no, there's a system at play that needs to be challenged here. Vivek, it was a pleasure having you. I could talk to you all day about this issue and I'm grateful that you were generous with your time today. Please come back, would love to continue this conversation. It would be my pleasure and thanks as always for having me. Thank you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.